Uh, just a, a quick announcement before we begin. We'll, of course, be having a Good Friday service here uh, at 10. 10. 10. And a Monday, Thursday service as well at 7 o'clock Thursday evening. Uh, but there'll be more details about that to come. That's here soon. also? That will be here also. Yeah. And then Easter Sunday here? Easter Sunday's here, yeah. And if, uh, if well, anybody that's interested, let's bring memorial flowers again for Easter yes. Sunday. Hmm. Okay, so I, I'll take the list. Just if you have someone specific in mind you want the flowers in memory of, then we'll just have a little list that goes with the bulletin. Thank you, Janice, for thinking. Any other announcements? Oh, there's going to be a board Zoom meeting tonight, the web Tuesday night. Did you remember that? I did not. Thanks for reminding me. And you're doing the Zoom? I'll Zoom. <laughs> Seven I'll Zoom it. <laughs> Seven o'clock. Okay. So as we gather, let us sing together. In for it, Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, our lives. Stuart and William Ford to extinguish the candle. Uh, Bar Mary. <laughs> Your grandma said you would, so. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome home, to renew our friendship with God. What does the word home mean to you? A place of security and comfort after a hard day. A place of safety in times of trouble. The earth itself. Today's readings remind us that home means any place where we are welcomed and nurtured. We read of how God welcomed home our biblical ancestors. The parable of the prodigal son reminds us that God never turns us away. No matter who we are or what we do, God always invites us to the banquet of God's welcoming and inclusive love. The younger son is welcomed home with great rejoicing. The dutiful but somewhat resentful older son is affirmed and invited to join the banquet. We too are welcomed by God who invites us. As in the Corinthians reading, to be God's special friends. Okay. <clears throat> Let us pray together. Patient God, you care for us and attend us. Help us to bear fruit for you. Companion God, we walk your Lenten path. Walk beside us as a friend on the way. Generous God, your love pours out upon us. Help us to share your gifts. Passionate God, 
The way of love and justice is sometimes hard and risky. Help us to trust in you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let us pray together our prayer of approach. Creator and sustainer of all that is, we offer thanks for what you have given us, the healing, the helping, the coming together of your people in this time of change and challenge. Loving God, remind us through spirit, we are never alone, you are ever near. You are with us in every breath, every heartbeat, every movement of the outstretched arms of your children. Holy Presence, hear our prayer for our families, our communities, workers, and vulnerable people, that your healing energy is at work today and every day. Let us be comforted in this, knowing that God is with us. We are not alone. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Voices United 260, God Who Gives to Life Its Goodness. we ask for God's mercy and love as we pray together God of love and mercy when we pause for a moment in your presence the daily details of our lives press in on us we recall things left undone opportunities ignored we remember careless words spoken disappointments that trouble our souls in silence, we offer to you our misspent moments and missed opportunities. Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us Christ to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. Remember the promise of the Apostle Paul that the Apostle Paul declares. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship, distress, peril, or sword? 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through the God who loves us. Neither death nor life, things present nor things to come, can separate us from the love in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for such a promise. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Do you kids want to come up for a story? You like a story today? It's okay if you don't either. It's up to you. Yeah? Okay. It's a story called Those Darn Squirrels. Oh, no. <laughs> We've got a live one. Do you want to? A live squirrel? Yeah. Uh, we're okay. okay. <laughs> Where do you want to sit? You just want to stand? Okay, sure. Well, here, I'll sit down with you guys here. There we go. So have you guys ever heard the word reconciliation before? No? Never heard it before? So it kind of means, I guess, have you ever had a fight with someone? Yeah? And you kind of didn't really like them for a while, kind of feel bad about it, but then you said sorry, then they said sorry, and then you were okay again, you were friends again. Has that ever happened to you? That's never happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're friends again, exactly. You kind of get over the hurt, right? You kind of move on. That's a little bit what reconciliation is like. And um, in the gospel today, Jesus talks about reconciliation. He talks about the story of a, of a son who leaves his father, takes all his, the possessions that his father gives him, goes, spend, goes and spends it all, and basically uh, takes off and is afraid to go home because he thinks his dad isn't going to forgive him or welcome him home. But he does. And it's a lesson of how God always welcomes us home. God always wants to be reconciled with us, to be our friends. So this is a story called Those Darn Squirrels. It's about a guy who has, let's say, a, a difficult relationship with squirrels. <laughs> On the outskirts of town, at the edge of the forest, there was a little old house. The only thing under, the only thing older than the little house was the man who lived in it, Old Man Footwire. Oops. Old Man Footwire was so old that when he sneezed, dust came out. He was also a grump. He hated pie. He hated puppies. The only thing he liked was birds. All summer long, the old man painted pictures of the birds that visited his backyard. There were whirly birds and bonga birds, baba birds and yaba birds even a rare flugel bird that came once or twice. <laughs> Footwire's paintings weren't very good, but the birds never said anything. When the air turned crisp and the leaves began to change color, the old man grew sad. He knew that soon the birds would fly south for the winter, as they did every year, and that he would be lonely. Then he had an idea. If he fed the birds, maybe they'd stick around. So Old Man Footwire built beautiful bird feeders and put them up all around his backyard. He filled the feeders with delicious seeds and berries, and soon the birds came from all over the forest just to eat in the old man's yard. But the birds weren't the only ones who liked the bird feeders. The squirrels did too. Not many people know this, but squirrels are the cleverest of the woodland creatures. In fact, they're fuzzy little geniuses. They can make a house out of a tree, a bed out of a bunch of leaves, and a box kite out of twigs, dirt, and squirrel spit. They are also excellent at math. See, they got a little abacus there. <laughs> Winter was fast approaching, and the squirrels needed to gather as much food as they could to get ready. So they decided to take some of the bird food. The birds, or the birds, were not happy. Neither was Old Man Footwire. When he discovered what had happened, he shook his fist and yelled, Those darn squirrels! 
He filled up the bird feeders again, but this time he hung them from a clothesline. He went back inside, confident that the squirrels would no longer be able to get the seeds and the berries. But the squirrels were determined. They devised a plan, and this time they took all the food from the bird feeders. The birds were furious. Harumph, they yelled, a bonga bird. Those darn squirrels, yelled the old man footwire. Yum, said the squirrels. <laughs> See, they're all fat and sleepy from eating. <laughs> now it was old man Footwire's turn to devise a plan. He went to the general store to get supplies. He bought lasers and clamps. He bought wires and springs. He bought all sorts of tools and built a veritable fortress around his bird feeders. Then he refilled them very carefully. Na na na, snorted the flugel bird. The squirrels stayed up all night working out their strategy. They drank cherry cola and ate salt and vinegar chips to help them stay awake. <laughs> Finally, they had it, the perfect plan. <clears throat> they, put it on the, they put on their tiny helmets and prepared to launch themselves into the air over the fence, between the lasers and onto the bird feeders. The first squirrel misfired and hit a tree. The second squirrel went too high and landed in a bucket. The third squirrel sailed clear over the house. The birds laughed and laughed. They each had one last delicious mouthful of seeds and berries from the old man feeders, old man's feeders, and they flew south for the winter, just as they did every year. After the birds left, old man footwear was lonely just as he was every year. He fixed himself some cottage cheese and pepper, his favorite snack, but he was still lonely. When he looked out the window, the squirrels could tell that he wasn't very happy. Go away, shouted the old man. I don't like you squirrels. The squirrels had a meeting deep in a large tree. They decided to give the old man a present to make up for taking his seeds and berries. Now, not many people know this, but squirrels are not only fuzzy little geniuses, they also collect just about anything they find on the ground. These squirrels had a vast stockpile of spectacular junk to choose from. But what would he like? Bottle caps? Popsicle sticks? Poached stamps? Finally, they had it. The perfect gift. The squirrels stacked all of their loose change on Old Man Footwire's doorstep. There were dimes and pennies, there were nickels and quarters, there was even a few tokens from Coco's Arcade. It all added up to $47.36, plus a few rounds of skee-ball. Maybe you squirrels aren't so bad, Footwire said when he found the coins, but I still like birds better. This gave the squirrels another idea. They raided their junk collection again and got to work. When Old Man Footwire woke up the next morning, he was amazed to see that the birds had returned. But wait, those things weren't birds. They were squirrels in disguise. Great googly moogly, said Old Man Footwire. This will make quite a painting. He ran outside and took down the lasers and the wires and the spring-loaded trapeze. He turned on all the bird feeders. He turned all the beef bird feeders into squirrel feeders that he painted with his brush until he ran out of bristles. The squirrels were so overjoyed, they had a party in Old Man Footwire's house. Those darn squirrels, said Footwire, and he shook his old man fist and smiled. The end. <laughs> so they ended up being friends in the end and reconciled. And that's what God wants for all of us, to be reconciled with God and to be friends with each other. Sounds good? Okay, thanks guys. Back to your seats. Our next hymn is a Spirit of Gentleness.
Joshua chapter 9, chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal in, to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover or on the 14th day of the month of twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain, and on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day that after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but it, they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. This is the story of God's people. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> The responsorial psalm is Psalm 32, which is page 759 in Voices United, 759. Be glad in God, you righteous. Rejoice, O saints, rejoice. Blessed are those whose offenses are forgiven, whose sin has been put away. Blessed are those to whom God imputes no guilt, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Be glad in God, you rejoice, O saints, rejoice. When I kept silence, my body wasted away while I groaned all the day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My strength dried up as if the summer's drunk. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, my guilt I did not hide. I said I will confess my sins to God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you in time of trouble. When great flood water rises, it shall not come near them. You are a hiding place for me. You will preserve me from trouble. You will surround me with shouts of deliverance. You glad God, you righteous. Rejoice in the saints to Jesus. I will teach you and guide you in the ways you should go. I will keep you under my eye and instruct you. Be not like horse or mule without understanding, whose course must be checked with bit and bridle. Many pains are in store for the wicked, but whoever trusts in God is surrounded by steadfast love. Be glad in God, righteous. 
Rejoice, O saints, rejoice. Today's gospel is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, and 11 to 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? And here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves to ask what was going on. And he replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the story of Jesus. Thanks be to God. In the United Church of Canada's 2006 statement of faith called a song of faith there's a reference to change it reads through word music art and sacrament in community and in solitude god changes our lives our relationships and our world specifically in regards to baptism a song of faith states baptism is a ritual that signifies our rebirth in faith and cleansing by the power of God. Baptism signifies the nurturing, sustaining, and transforming power of God's love. In other words, God is even now working to change the world, transforming it into the kingdom about which Jesus taught us. And one of the ways in which God changes the world is by changing us. Baptism is one of the most visible and obvious ways through which we are changed. 
Although babies look more or less the same after they've been baptized, albeit a little wetter, maybe a little more cranky, they are changed in regards to their relationship with God and the church. They are now fully and truly a son or daughter of God, a brother or sister of Jesus, a full member of the church, the body of Christ, and the Holy Spirit dwells within them. Baptism is what we call in fancy theological language a liminal event. Liminal sort of means threshold or transformative. A liminal event is a distinct occasion where something about us changes, our personhood, our status, our relationship. Liminal events can be sacred or mundane, public or private, a huge deal or a tiny shift. Many of us share common liminal events at the same times in our lives. At 16, we get our driver's license. At 18, we get to vote, gamble, and consume alcohol. Our high school graduation, completion of a degree or a professional program, getting married, getting divorced, becoming a parent or grandparent, getting our first old age security check, retirement, all these official liminal events are what many of us have or will have and mark a specific point in our lives. There's a great many other unofficial liminal events that we undergo as well. Our first kiss, the first time we fall in love, the first time we fall out of love, the first car we buy, our first job, the first time we've been rejected in a significant way or betrayed, the first time we realize a friend isn't really a friend, the first time we've really and truly felt unconditional love, the times someone we love deeply and was a huge part of our lives dies, the times when we real realize we have in someone a true and authentic friend. All these unofficial events change us. They change our personality, our outlook on life, our sense of self, our sense of humanity, our goals for the future. They can change how we live our lives, and they can cause us to ask fundamental questions like, who am I? What do I want? Where am I going? What do I want to achieve? What makes me truly happy? Lent is a liminal event in the church calendar which invites us to explore the liminal moments of our lives as individuals or communities. We encounter the Israelites today at a major liminal moment in their history. Moses, who led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai to receive the covenant and led them through the wilderness 40 years, has died. Joshua is now the leader of the Hebrew people, and today we hear the very first day they no longer had to eat manna, but the produce of the land which would become their homeland. They were on the threshold of becoming a nation. It wasn't an easy transformation, as we well know. It was full of complaining and fighting and resisting. The people were seduced by lies into worshiping a golden calf. There was anger and destruction even by Moses. There was reconciliation and renewal. Interestingly, the people we've come to understand as the Hebrew people likely weren't just the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as the scriptures seem to imply, so neat and tidy. The word habaru or aparu was a Sumerian word similar to dusty or dirty. It was a catch-all term used to describe outlaws and slaves and laborers, sort of the people of the dust, those without a home or a capital city. And so it was probably actually this raggle-taggle group of misfits that escaped slavery in Egypt and had to learn how to become a people under the leadership of Moses and now Joshua. It just goes to show that not all liminal or threshold events are clear and precise. Taking an oath to become a citizen is one thing, but living 40 years in the wilderness eating manna will definitely change a person. They had to learn to work together, to care for each other, 
to respect each other, to see how God united them, and that their differences weren't a threat, but were beautiful diversity, the essence of the covenant. If we think of our own baptism, which symbolizes the new covenant in and through Christ, sure it appears neat and tidy, the baby usually has a beautiful gown, their families gathered with the church community, it's a party. But the actual process of that baby growing and figuring out who they are, how the world works, what they want in life, how to be a disciple of Christ, and perhaps how they are called to change how the world works is messy, it's complicated. There's setbacks, mistakes, but also hopefully much to be grateful for. And the point of the covenant and Jesus gospel parable is that God is with, this, with us in this process the whole time. We call this parable the prodigal son, but the star of the show is really the father. And it's the father who is the one who is prodigal. To be prodigal is to give freely, lavishly, extravagantly, recklessly even. The father's prodigalness isn't in the feast he throws for his son who has returned. The feast is a symbol of the father's prodigalness in terms of his unconditional love. Even after essentially wishing his father dead at the beginning of the parable, asking for your inheritance is like wishing your parent dead, and taking off to live a meaningless life, the father is watching for his son's return. One can almost imagine at every pause in his work, the father gazing towards the horizon to see if his son was coming home. And when he does, he embraces his son with unconditional love and reconciliation. In this parable, we see God's relationship with us. God's for, love for us is unconditional, unending, all enveloping and prodigal. We don't have to wait for major liminal threshold events to know God's love for us. Each day, each moment, we stand on the threshold of a new life that awaits us, a life of abundance and love. All we need to do is reach out and accept God's embrace. Each new day is a new opportunity for reconciliation, to reach out to someone with whom we've quarreled or been distanced from. Each new day is an opportunity to communicate how we feel and to pursue our dreams. Each new day is an opportunity to tell our beloved ones how much we love and appreciate them. Each new day is an opportunity to marvel at God's creation. Luke captures beautiful, joyful images of God in his 15th chapter. The shepherd who finds the lost sheep and celebrates with his friends. The woman who lost her coin and rejoices with her neighbors. And this father who embraces his young son and throws a party upon his return. The point is God celebrates. God celebrates us. Every single one of us. Not every party is going to be ours. Not every day is going to have a plethora of personal victories that cause us to rejoice in exuberance. And there are certainly times, like perhaps right now, when we need to call out injustices in our world. It's not always a party. However, God always provides us someone or something that needs celebrating. Part of our Christian discipleship is to not be like the elder brother, is simply to join the party. Each day is a day to pray the Easter Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And our next hymn is more of our voices 144, like a human stream. Yeah. 
is entitled A Hundred Million Signatures for Peace. Seventy years is enough. Let's end the Korean War. That's the message of the recently launched global campaign called Korea Peace Appeal, where you can sign an online petition. The goal of the appeal is to collect a hundred million signatures for peace by 2023, <coughs> the 70th anniversary of the armistice. The ultimate goal is peace. The Korean War began in 1950, and while open clashes ceased in 1953 with the signing of an armistice, a peace treaty has not yet been established, so the war is not over. For more than 70 years, the Korean people have endured a constant state of hostility and war, which has solidified the division of the peninsula. For more than 30 years, your gifts through mission service have supported justice and peace work in Korea through the National Council of Churches in Korea. The NCCK supports women's programs, human rights, and peace and reconciliation efforts. The NCCK has established, has challenged the United Church of Canada to add 10,000 signatures to the Korean Peace Appeal by this summer. The request is urgent, so please join the moderator and others by adding your signature today. The point of the campaign is to urge an end to the Korean War and establish a peace agreement, says Patty Talbot. United Church's team lead for global partnership. Sometimes it can be hard to know how to take action on large global issues. By adding your signature to this campaign, we can take a tangible step to help create a world free from nuclear weapons and nuclear threats and break the vicious cycle of the arms race. Your support through Mission Service actively supports peace peacemaking in Korea. If you would like to take another step to help, please consider signing the petition and add your name to those calling for peace, for we are stronger together. And I'll add a link to that on our website uh, this week. Offertory Invitation. 
The Apostle Paul declared that in Christ there is a new creation. Everything has become new. What new things can God do with the gifts we offer today? With expectant hearts, let us place in God's hands what we have to offer in Christ's name. Offertory prayer together. These symbols of the sweat of our brow we present to you, O God, as an act of trust. Trust that they will continue to your mission in the world. Trust that we will become instruments of your will. Trust that you will bless the giving and the givers. Amen. We turn now to God to pray for our needs and the needs of the people around the world. Creator God, you have made all things and, and called them good. We pray for the earth and its vulnerability, depleted by our lifestyle choices and our economic expectations. Inspire reverence for the earth in all people Guide us to make wiser choices for the sake of your creation and help us use resources wisely with future generations in mind, guarding the fragile balances you have set between many precious species. Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, you taught us of God's reconciling grace. In the story of a father who welcomed back his wandering son, and invited his jealous son to open his heart. Speak to the hearts of all your people in this time when so many neighbors and nations sit in judgment upon each other, provoking conflict and resentment. Teach us how to seek peace on earth together. Call those in positions of power and influence to work for the common good. Turn us away from anger, fear, violence or vanity, which can turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. May all who claim your name be known as makers of peace. Christ, healer of hearts and hopes, you desire health and wholeness for each one of us. We pray that those who have lost their livelihoods during the pandemic may find true abundance. Grant rest and renewal to those who are broken, in body, mind, or spirit, especially healthcare workers. And bring comfort and hope to all who face loss and loneliness. God of power and maker of all creation, God of justice and maker of peace, we are so distressed by the violence and threats of violence and destruction in our world especially the acts of war and brutality that people are experiencing in Ukraine. In solidarity with them, we pray for those who are suffering in danger or living in fear and anxiety, fear of what tomorrow will bring, who are anxious for their lives and the lives of their loved ones, to a mourning for those who have died. We pray that those with power over war will lay down weapons and that those who have power to accomplish peace will have wisdom and compassion. God of grace and giver of life, send your Holy Spirit everywhere and fill all people to sustain hope of those who seek justice and peace and to inspire leaders of nations to do what is right. God, to you we give glory, Christ, Creator and Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The last hymn is, uh, I see a new church. It wasn't in the hymnals, but you'll be uh, very familiar with the tune. blessing of God who made us in love, who made us for companionship, who made us to enhance and strengthen the world, go with us as we leave this place into all the places life calls us to be. We do not go alone, we go loved and blessed and to be a blessing. Amen. Jesus